Uh, first off, um, just call me Steph. Uh, thank you very much for hanging around right until the end of the day. I know it's quite long, especially anyone standing up. Um, my background, I study, um, I'm doing a PhD in impairment and disability in the Roman world, looking through skeletal remains. Um, during that study, you come across the deviant burial terminology a lot. Um, studying, I am an, from an osteoarchaeological background, and um, studying disability through uh, skeletal impairments um, can be a tad controversial, uh, especially um, today people don't necessarily uh, disable people or anyone who identifies themselves with that form of identity do not want to be epitomised by the impairment that the doctor labels them with. Uh, so um, we get into a bit of a rut, I think, with the body being the epitome of the biology and the grave being the epitome of the social. And I challenge this. I think you can get quite a lot of social information through the skeletal remains, and that's something I try to do throughout my PhD. Uh, so, I, in this presentation, it's going to be quite brief, I'm going to talk to you about a very single case study from the Roman period. Um, uh, this is a prone burial. We've heard a lot about prone burials. Uh, it's not as... Uh, I, I think there's almost a scale of deviancy going along. It's not as an extreme as having, say, a stone in your mouth or anything like that. Um, but it's, I think it's an interesting case study. And... Um, I, what I intend to do, I don't honestly know how to interpret it. It's a bit of a, it's causing me some, lots of ideas going around and I intend to share that with you. Um, but I, I honestly don't have any firm ideas or conclusions going on here. So I'm grateful for any feedback. Um, so in prone burial, we've heard a lot about what prone burial is. Um, but just a reminder, it's face down. And um, as I said, it's one of the sort of less extreme forms of deviancy. <laughs> but it catches people's attention and it comes up an awful lot. And um, it's a, especially in the world of media, uh, it's really caught attention in terms of um, you get associated uh, instant associations with witchcraft, or in this case, a sex craze nun, which I particularly enjoyed. Um, the, uh, the action seems to, in the literature, be associated with this idea of hu humiliation or some kind of necrophobia, some kind of fear of that dead, or some kind of punishment. And, and this is very much potential, but this, I think this case study kind of doesn't necessarily fit in some ways, but I will demonstrate. Um, my case study is from Allington Avenue. Uh, this is a late Roman site from Dorset, which is in the south of Britain, excavated in 1984 to 1987. Uh, it's actually got a long period of use from the late Neolithic uh, right along to the medieval, as is the land. Um, but the inhumation and the cemetery base was kept going from Iron Age to late Roman and it's been a cause of great interest to people because of that continuing tradition. However, for me, I'm just interested in the late Romans from the 3rd to the 4th century AD, of which there were 19 inhumations that could be of interest. And my particular individual of interest was Skeleton 852. Uh, he is a male of over 60 years and um, age of death, and it's pretty good preservation. Not a lot of the thorax is remaining, um, but it's, it's quite good, well preserved. And it was found in a coffin, uh, there's evidence that he was buried in a coffin. And he was quite tall, he was uh, one meter 73, which is, compared to everybody else, he was quite tall. And he was buried prone, as you can see there. Um, and also, when we were talking about disability and impairment, he, this gentleman um, suffered an amputation in the, his mid shaft of his right hand <coughs> side humerus, uh, which is your top arm. Um, this individual showed no healing at all. Uh, so we're going to surmise that this was cause of death. Um, 
or at least very close to death. What's interesting, therefore, to note is that the rest of the arm is missing, despite it being fairly close. Um, we can uh, look at this injury in a number of ways. Uh, it could have been um, accidental trauma, or punitive, or um, medical. Um, I'm sort of leaning towards medical. Um, punitive, it seems an odd location for, but I am open to if anyone has any more information about punitive acts in this age and punitive amputation. Um, and um, in the middle, that's the end of the injury. Um, I've seen um, evidence of serration, so I'm going for that was saw, sawn off. Um, so amputation in the Roman world, they were very good at it. Um, there was a lot of literature going around into the central empire. How much it went to Britain is hard to tell. Um, it was definitely a last resort. Uh, they didn't have any anaesthesia, obviously, <laughs> and um, all, all very successful antiseptic. They had some, but not great. So if they're going to do it for medical purposes, it's going to be a last resort. And obviously it didn't work in this case. <coughs> um, what's also interesting about this individual is, bar oh, this very clear case, paleologically, pa pale Paleopathologically, there you go. Uh, there was nothing else really on it. Uh, he has um, some of the best dental health for his age group compared to the rest of them. Uh, everybody else in his age group are losing teeth left, right, and centre. He's got them all. <laughs> He's doing really well. And um, we don't. I, I hesitate when we sort of say that the body sort of represents good health. Because, you know, absence of pathology on the body, on the skeleton, doesn't mean it was ill. <laughs> it's the ostological parad paradox um, all over again. But when you've been living for over 60 years, we expect to see some signs of wear and tear. And he doesn't seem to have much on there at all. Um, what I aim to show you with this individual is that... Although this is quite an extreme case of pain and pathology, quite a lot of what else happened to him and his experience seems to be fairly normative. And one of the key ways I demonstrate this is through the use of, um, well, somebody else's dietary isotopic data. Um, this is not my data. This is Rebecca Redfern's. Uh, she took it as part of a bigger sample from uh, the Dorset area and he was looking for changes over time. But I extracted the sections that were used for me. These are the what she took from Allenton Avenue. And what I just aim to show is not necessarily, I don't know exactly what he was eating, but I can perhaps say that the trends within his population, the limited that we have, with no way to do statistics on this particularly, trends looking that way seem to suggest he's right in the cluster rather than an outlier on what he's eating. And that's what I am to demonstrate by that. Uh, here is a bit more. Uh, I showed you the photograph earlier. This is more of a schematic of what's going on in his burial. It's a bit easier to see. Um, I'm not certain of this yet. It's something I noticed the other day. But I think he's too tall for his coffin. <laughs> I was looking at because um, I remember that it was actually um, last night um, I was heard someone suggesting about prone burial and it could sometimes be accidental and I was trying to double check that with photography and I was like why is he why is he bent that way why is he bent oh I don't think he can stretch out so I don't think he fit <laughs> um, he was wearing hob hobnail shoes in his burial and wearing clothes. Uh, in that time, in his burial, seemed uh, I've been using um, uh, anthropology to tell on uh, procedures using photographs to try and um, deconstruct whether they were shrouded or clothed or coffined and stuff. Uh, they tend to be mostly coffined and they tend to be mostly clothed. Quite a lot of them are wearing hobnails, so this is quite standard to be put in there with his shoes on. And um, but what did stand out was that he was buried with his dog. And in um, another site where I was 
uh, studying quite recently, um, being buried with your pet, as I would interpret it, um, was seen as quite a sentimental thing to do. So that's where that kind of strange prone is quite negative, but a very <coughs> negative pet is quite sentimental. This kind of strange ambivalence is coming through. I don't know if you agree with me, but I think that's where I'm confused, that's where I'm stuck. So I feel that the narrative coming through here is that of quite mixed feelings. And um, it seems quite strange, because usually disability is about the living. And obviously this, well, I think this killed him. But um, I see, uh, firstly, our theory surrounding disability is slightly different in terms of I kind of feel that everybody has a part of their identity related to their body's ability or disability. And we all, that can change over time. In terms of your changing ability or your changing age, that can change. So it's not necessarily a binary, uh, you're disabled or you're not, but instead you can be somewhere in between. Um, I think also that just because you died doesn't mean your disabled identity doesn't have an impact. Obviously death has a massive impact on your identity, sounds really obvious, and equally as obvious, it also has a massive effect on your agency. <laughs> but um, a concept I'm sort of coming through with is the idea of a disabled corpse, and this idea of this... Um, where was it going? Um, this sort of your... I was doing so well. Um, so the idea of the disabled corpse and um, this moment in your... This, your, your visual impact in your burial as well as, um, has had a massive impact at that moment. And it doesn't represent your life. It represents a very small part of your experience, but it's had a very massive impact on that moment, as in your burial, but also how we have interpreted it. Uh, sorry about having a bit of a hesitation there. So I think the, how I'm concluding here is this isn't necessarily death reflecting life. I think that's one of the main things I want to try and get across is that deviant burial process doesn't necessarily go they were um, rejected during lifetime. Um, but I also think that osteology, and I hope I demonstrated that osteology, um, has a lot more to tell you than just the biology. Um, I think I'll leave it there. I would like to offer the following acknowledgements.